All right, guys, we're back again with another great episode of PFREI. I'm your host, Fuquan Blau. It's going, another, it's going to be another great show. We got Jack Krupe here from JCAM Alternative Investments. Jack and I know each other uh, from the note space, so I'm, I'm really happy to do this interview to talk about um, his transition into what he's doing now, multifamily. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the market. By the way, guys, you probably can't see me if you do see me on YouTube or one of the uh, channels that played the video. I'm all dressed up today. We just did our quarterly uh, to set our rocks and deliverables for our one year goal for 2023. So I'm pretty excited about that. Had a chance to um, share financial information with the team with that transparency to let them know where we are, what we need to do, where the climate of the market is. So it was a really great meeting today. But I was super excited when I saw that this podcast was scheduled. I was like, oh, man, I got Jack coming on the show. This is great, man. It's good to see you again, buddy. How yeah, are absolutely. you? Absolutely. Thanks for having me. All right. For those who don't know you, who's probably been under a rock somewhere, um, you could tell them your story, your journey, and a little bit more about you. Sure. So uh, I've been in real estate uh, 20 years, over 20 years at this point. Uh, now, I, I, I got into real estate uh, right out of college. I uh, thought I was going to go into the IT industry, but I, I graduated during the dot-com crisis and uh, uh, bought one of those paperback books, How to how to Make a Million Dollars in Real Estate, and uh, called my, my college landlord and uh, just asked him for advice. And uh, fortunately, he owned about 20 houses and he was a real estate broker. And you know, within two months, I'd bought a house, almost no money down. Wow. And uh, really just rode that kind of that infomercial dream of uh, buying houses, low money down. I did subject to, I was wholesaling. I got my broker's license and was uh, you know brokering some transactions. So uh, up until 2008, I really just dove right in head first and uh, and learn the business. So then uh, when the financial crisis happened, um, I wanted to relocate back towards, I grew up in New Jersey and always wanted to live in New York City. So uh, everything had somewhat frozen in Rochester, literally and figuratively <laughs> when I uh, was, uh, was up there. So I uh, moved down to New York and uh, was fortunate to find a, a job at a private equity fund buying non-performing mortgages. So I was on Wall Street in uh, November of 2008. And uh, you know, the bleeding edge of the financial crisis. And, uh, you know, that's uh, wh where we met soon after. And that was probably the trade of the trade of the decade for sure was buying non-performing mortgages. It was a uh, uh, amazing business. It still is. It's just not, you know, the volume of, of deals isn't, isn't what it was back then. So, um, you know, lived in New York for 10 plus years, grew in the mortgage space, uh, ended up partnering with a large private equity fund. And, uh, bought over 30,000 loans uh, between 2014 and 2020. And, uh, you know, it was doing great. We had incredible growth, but uh, eventually, you know, I got into real estate to, to have that passive income and that financial freedom. And I ended up creating myself uh, a job and, uh, you know, it was a lot of hours and, you know, was uh, oftentimes looking at Excel spreadsheets and, you know, yelling at foreclosure attorneys or yelling at vendors. And it, it turned into more of a corporate role than I was looking for. So um, I'd been passively investing in multifamily and various uh, syndicated asset classes. And uh, a number of the groups I had success with, success with said uh, that there was room in the industry for, for me to create my own fund and essentially invest in, in, into syndication deals and help, help passive investors invest alongside me. Um, cause I could never take, uh, I could never take investors when I was in New York, we had pension funds and family offices and larger groups. I could never actually, I had so many friends and family and people that wanted to invest that I just didn't have a vehicle to, uh, to, to help them. So it's been a great transition for me. I also moved to sunny Puerto Rico and, yeah. uh, love the weather and the community down here. And, uh, yes, yeah, so now I run JCAM investments from, uh, from Puerto Rico and we invest in the Southeast and the Sun Belt across Primarily multifamily, but other syndicated asset classes, self storage, mobile home parks, et cetera. Yeah, that's awesome, man. So you just skip past the whole fish in the refrigerator story, man. My guests got to hear that. Oh, <laughs> oh man. So, I remember that story. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's one of the joys of the joys of being a landlord. Everybody, everybody thinks, you know, you watch these house flipping shows and you think life is so, so glamorous. Uh, one of our, one of our evictions. Uh, the tenants, I guess, were either they were a little spiteful or just really careless because uh, they had went fishing the day before and they had a couple pretty big fish in the freezer. And, uh, you know, they they ended up uh, moving out, got evicted, the power's off. 
and they left the they left the freezer closed with a couple fish in there and it stewed for a week in in the middle of summer before we got the got to clean out the property so uh i just remember driving by to check on it and i've got i see my two maintenance guys the stairwell was so tight that they had to actually take the door off of the refrigerator and freezer to get it down the stairs and the smell was was horrific and so you've got the two maintenance guys and uh, the guy up top actually lost his lunch and threw up as they're carrying the thing down the, uh, down the stairs. And I'm outside and laughing, kind of laughing and kind of not trying to throw up myself because I'm, uh, it's like that school bus effect or uh, where they say the vomino effect of, uh, of like once one person goes, the other ones start going. So it was, uh, uh, it, it was a, a lesson on the, the joys of being a landlord and why I try to, well, I try to structure into larger deals where I don't have to deal with that anymore. <laughs> yeah, that was funny when you told me that. I was like, "That's crazy." <laughs> uh, I could imagine you trying to carry a refrigerator out and fish falling all over you, but you was viewing that. So let's talk about what's happening in the current market, man. So I know you made the pivot to multifamily. We both actually did over the last couple of years. Uh, we both came from the note business. I saw that. I saw the right in the wall, right? So regulation started to hit. Pricing started to increase. You really couldn't get it. Um, the bang for the buck or the returns or yields, um, at least on my side, I wasn't seeing that. So I knew I had to make a pivot. When I met up with you a years later, it was like, yeah, I'm doing multifamily. I was like, oh, that's awesome, man. So what are you seeing right now in the marketplace? We were just talking a little bit about before I press record that things are slowing down um, a little bit. You know, the deals are, I mean, it's coming around, but it's slowing down. I think the sellers are coming into a realization that this thing is real. I mean, the, the rate just increased again. So let's talk a little bit about that. What are you seeing on your end, man? Sure. So uh, a couple things, you know, the headlines that you'll see on CNBC are very different than what, what we're really doing in the multifamily market. So um, if you see a headline on CNBC about just the housing market crashing, the type of multifamily, the type of value add type of deals that you invest in, I invest in, completely different than what the standard headlines that you're going to see in the Wall Street Journal or CNBC. You know, the workforce housing is a, is a unique niche. Uh, they're, they're generally bought for below replacement cost. You, you cannot build a new 150 unit building that is a class B, a workforce housing, middle class housing. You just can't build it now with the cost of, of materials. So it's its own little niche. And it doesn't really, you know, basically don't believe all the hype that the sky is falling and real estate is going to crash. So, you know, part of the reason I made the pivot is, Watching what was happening with inflation, watching what was happening uh, with, with with interest rates, and you know, I don't necessarily want to be an owner of debt when you have, um, you know, probably double digit inflation. If you look at the the shadow stats on how they used to track the the inflation, so you know, what I loved about multifamily is it's again it's bought below replacement cost. There's a shortage of workforce housing, and we're generally investing in areas that have po strong population growth. And, and COVID really unlocked that as well. There's maybe 10, 20% of people who could work remote now that couldn't a few years ago. And uh, that's that's amazing for, for these areas in the Southeast and the Sun Belt where, where people are moving. Um, you know, the other thing is the average baby boomer turned 65 this year. So just demographically, they may move from the Northeast and, and most of the baby boomers are probably gonna buy a single family house. But that again, starts pricing out and propping up the pricing for the larger single family houses. And you, you have the, the workforce housing that can't afford three, four hundred to five hundred thousand dollars for a single family. And with interest rates higher, the it, it makes it even harder. The payment is practically doubled for what you, you know, what you'd have to pay now for a mortgage compared to a year ago. So I, I think there's still, even with interest rates moving up, there's still a lot of positive things happening. And uh, to your point about the sellers. Um, yeah, pricing prices have, have certainly adjusted. Uh, I think some sellers are, uh, many sellers are realizing now that, uh, you know, any buyer who's going to buy has to factor in a higher interest rate and that affects the, ultimately affects the, the income that the building can generate. And, and most sellers are, are savvy enough to, to realize that. And, um, you know, they're, they're adjusting accordingly, but most of them don't have to sell either. And unless they have a balloon payment or a life event, uh, you know, some sellers may, May may sit it out and wait to see what happens with rates. If rates go down, prices will likely um, you know start to creep up again. Um, but yeah, you know, we said this before uh, the call as well. I think I, I want to make sure the audience hears it. Um, in the value add space, there's so much value increase from renovating the rental units that it, it it's uh, it'll overcome any issue with interest rates, 
with vacancy rates. If you do a good job in a value add and you spend between five and 10,000 in renovation, and that, that renovation will raise the rent by three to $500 a month. If you're raising rent by $500 a month and you have a 5% cap rate, you can multiply that five by 20. And that raises the value of the building by $100,000 per unit that you may be spending five to 10 in renovating. So the, it's so compelling that even if interest rates move up a little higher and operating expenses go a little higher, the, the amount of value you're creating there is going to far surpass any any short-term market condition. Yeah. I just want to clarify something for our audience. So you, you're talking about a $300 rent, a rent bump. You, you're you speaking of class B, um, B and up. Are you, are you gauging that, that what you just said from? Uh, yeah, and, and it's three three to five hundred. It depends on the market. Um, and uh, so, for example, I just got a report on our deals in uh, Jacksonville, Florida. Um, rents are up sixty seven percent on a renovated unit from from a classic unit to a renovation. They're getting sixty seven percent higher rents. Um, we're invested in a deal in Phoenix, a ninety one percent increase uh, from from the prior. And again, these were units that were bought from a seller who um, just was really doing the bare minimum. Maybe they'd paint. Uh, but, you know, it was an older unit built in the early 80s, had never been renovated since the 80s. So um, it, it's a drastically different unit that's renting for I mean, when you talk about raising rent three, five, six, seven hundred. You know, you're, you're, you're showing the nicest class B type of unit uh, available. And uh, there, there's a, a large demand for those types of units uh, just because there's not a lot of good quality, affordable workforce housing available. Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, we have some C plus stuff. Um, that we that we purchased and bought, and we we can see the changes. So when we when we purchase this building, the owners because they own it for twenty years, fifteen years, they don't do anything, not much. They just maintain it, and they just want to get rid of it. So we can create a situation where it's definitely profitable for the one, and then we can take it over, do those uh, capex uh, repairs. We had one where rents were uh, six seventy five average rents, and we did a complete remodel of a unit. And I was just there last week and they said, hey, we're pushing for $900 a month for this unit. I said, what? I did a pro forma at 825. What are you talking about 900? Yeah, that's what the rents are now. I'm like, oh, that's awesome. I'm still happy if you get 825, but, you know, that's great to hear. So I can see what you're saying on that. I mean, and like what you said earlier, so it's a buffer hedge against inflation, right? If you're in multifamily, you do some repairs. Uh, and some, it depends on its market, guys. I want to just specify this is market related discussion we have in local. It's not across the board. We're saying, hey, in this town, you're going to get this. In that town, you're going to get that. So where he's investing at, he's giving you examples of areas he in. So are you in, um, you mentioned Phoenix. That's kind of, um, you mentioned Jacksonville, Florida. Do you have specific target market that you're in or, or uh, several? Uh, geographic yeah, it's, it's geographic several markets. Areas your, your, your strategy is in? Sure. Great question. Yeah. We're, we have a, you know, we're, we're not a direct operator in general ourselves. So what we do is we partner with, you know, world-class operators, you know, uh, we haven't uh, done a deal in a while, but I would partner with, uh, you know, you, you bring me a project and you're looking for extra, little extra capital. You know, I would invest with someone like you who's has the boots on the ground and is going to be the quarterback of the deal. So we have about 15 groups that I personally invested with over the years that uh, we have strong bonds. We're in mastermind groups together, uh, like like CG that you both are members of. So so we've got a group of operators, and each operator tends to have two or three markets that they like a lot. And I want to be diversified, so I, I like that I through one fund I can invest across multiple operators in multiple markets. So uh, that's what we like to do. We like to spread it around. So we follow the operator first, and then the market is sort of secondary. And, uh, you know, our operators are generally choosing growth markets. So, you know, we're in Augusta, Georgia, we're in Atlanta, we're in Phoenix, Dallas, Vegas, we're in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, we've got a deal in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. So, um, you know, the operator is really more important than the exact market. It's not that I might, I, I wouldn't be excited to do a deal in North Dakota, for example, even with <laughs> my favorite operator, but usually they're my favorite operator because they're probably not chasing a deal in North Dakota. <laughs> uh, yeah, so more like strategic value partnerships that you've created with these uh, with these deal makers, these, uh, and basically, okay, yeah, it makes sense, makes sense. So what's the plans for 2023? What are you, what are you guys looking at 
um, on the horizon, opportunities that are coming out? Are you structuring deals a little bit differently? Because, you know, um, what, what put, well, let me, I got two questions. We'll answer that one first, and then I got a follow-up question on the capital stack. What do you guys like to be at in the capital stack on the uh, syndication? Sure. So, you know, we were pretty careful this year, um, and some of it was just good luck. We actually finished our fund one in March of, uh, of this year. Uh, it was open for 18 months, and we we stopped taking new investments, and we started entering the harvest period. And then it took us about six weeks to get our paperwork done for our second fund. We kept changing things, improving things. And uh, yes, it always takes a little extra time to get a fund going. So, so because of that time that we were updating our documents, that's when interest rates started to move. So we, we got to go into 2022 with, with eyes wide opened. And, uh, you know, I, I had a, you know, I, I believed the hype that interest rates were going to go as aggressive as they did. And so we were very careful not to, you know, not to catch the falling knife and not to go into a deal where, where it only works at a very low interest rate. And, um, you know, we invested in a few funds that owned assets in 2021 that were also just finishing up their raises. So we got to lock in some fixed rate debt and some investments that were already bought before the rates moved. And, um, you know, again, just being selective, but really focusing on the value add where, where the deal makes sense, regardless of interest rates, because, the amount of value that we can unlock through renovations is is going to far surpass that. Um, you know, we, we have a self storage investment, um, mobile home parks. We haven't done, but we we like those. Those are it's the classic recession resistant asset classes. And uh, you know, I expect twenty twenty three, you know, to be more of the same. But we we also have looked at a few light industrial deals. Um, you know, I think that's a it's a great and growing asset class, and you know the. You know the contractors, the plumbing companies. They need a place to have an office and also have have a you know a workshop. And obviously the Amazons, the the e commerce. I mean, there's always a need for for industrial. So those are other asset classes uh, we look at. And then the last thing I've uh, spent a fair amount of time on is oil and gas. Um, not necessarily for me for tax purposes, uh, just as a real estate professional, but. Um, I found that oil and gas can offset active W-2 income. And I have a number of investors that are very, you know, high earning professionals that the depreciation only helps them so much. They get tax deferred income from me, but they don't, they can't really use it against their active income, but oil and gas can. So I tested a few deals personally uh, just to, you know, to get to know the market and they're going really well. And, uh, you know, it's something I'll probably continue to have as a five to 10% allocation of my own portfolio and, uh, you know, may get more involved, um, you know, on, on the fund side in the future. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so that was, that was part one and I'm sorry, I babbled enough. I, uh, I forgot. Oh, no, so that, it was, were you guys on the capital stack? Are you like mezzanine? Are you, cause af after the senior debt, are you uh, LP, GP? What do you guys like to be on those type yeah. of deals? So, so we're generally LP with better deal terms. So uh, we're often part of the GP, uh, but a minority partner in the GP because we are actively participating in in in, in the deal, uh, raising capital, investing our own money. So so our, our goal, especially as a fund of funds, if you will, is that I don't want to create double fees for for investors. So our goal is to you know use our economies of scale and our programmatic relationships to get much better deal terms than say the average investor might get if they put 25 or 50,000 into one deal uh, because we're writing a half million or million dollar check and we we're, we're there consistently for for the operators that we partner with you know for, for the most part any new deal they have you know if they like it we yeah you know, we, we do our own diligence but the, the operators that we've worked a lot with they kind of know what we like and we know what they like and you know usually they're not bringing us bad deals so um, yeah, we, we're generally in the LP position. And then as the market's adapted this year, we're seeing loan to values are lower. So the deals themselves are more conservative. I, even though interest rates have, have went up, it just it just means there's you take a lower loan to value and uh, you know lower your debt service for the short term and still focus on that value add. And if if rates uh if rates move favorably and, and, and drop over the next few years, maybe there's a more of a chance for a cash out refinance to uh return a fair amount of our capital tax uh you know, tax-free through a refinance. Um, and then we we are looking at preferred equity, uh, just given given where the market is. I, I I like some situations where we might be capped at 75 or 80 LTV through preferred equity and get and get ourselves paid first. Mm, so, so it's yeah, really yeah, a balance yeah. of 
it's a balance of things. We don't have a hard and fast rule, but primarily, I mean, you know, we, we do want the, as much upside as possible. So I mean, generally do prefer to just be on the equity side where we can, uh, you know, take advantage of the, you know, a, a building sells with a heavy value add. You know, we, we had a 97% IRR two years ago. We just had a 38% IRR in an exit recently. So, um, you know, we want those outsized returns. Those, those are certainly not guaranteed and don't happen all the time, but I, I want the ability to earn those, uh, those large returns when we execute on a project. Yeah, that's awesome, man. Yeah, it's amazing. Man. I, I like the uh, the uh, the journey from the note business to the multifamily business. I think multifamily is, I mean, notes is a really sophisticated investment. You got to know your stuff and and how to use those spreadsheets and everything else. So, you know, coming to the multifamily space is almost equivalent, right? All of the underwriting, everything that goes into it. It's like, I love it. It's It's so many things to figure out, right? Oh, absolutely. And there's definitely barriers to entry and, uh, you know, to, to get a loan with a Fannie Mae or these large loans on multifamily. I mean, you need to have a team of people with a significant net worth. Um, you know, the underwriting, the spreadsheets are just as complicated or more complicated. And, um, you know, I, I think, yeah, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, the one thing that's, I think, easier about multifamily is you get to get into the units uh, there's usually a pretty, uh, yeah, versus, versus, uh, the, the note right. business, it's a big mystery. You, you yeah, need to uncover yeah. all these rocks. You need to be a detective almost yeah, to make sure you yeah. don't, you don't want to buy a house where the BPO shows a beautiful front picture and the back of the house is, is torn, torn down. <laughs> um, so, so the access to information is, um, you know, is far superior. And, you know, usually there's a 50 page deck by Marcus and Millichap or one of the brokers that has tons of stats. So there's a lot more data available and you just need to weed through it and make sure, make sure it's the right data and make sure you're checking the comparables. Um, I, I focus so heavily on the rent comps because um, that that's the, that's the, the main success factor on, on a multifamily value add is what will you get after you've renovated and if you get that number right, like it sounds like you're you're getting 900 instead of 825. If you get that number right, that's 70 percent or 80 percent of the battle of of being successful uh, on a multifamily uh, acquisition is 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 nailing those rents. So uh, it's yeah, it's amazing, man. I'm I'm truly grateful that I made the pivot, um, you know, two and a half years ago. Because if I would have stayed with just fix and flips and notes, I would have been like, oh, God, right now it's crazy. You know, fix and flips is like we kind of slowed down that channel. Now we have a, a hybrid model where we do some flips for liquidity and uh, and multifamily for that cash flow. And we're, we're still close to New Jersey. So, uh, you know, things are sitting in the market a couple of weeks longer, but it's not so crazy. And the type of product we're doing is new renovation, ground up stuff. So, you know, I always say we're not bulletproof. We can be affected by the market. Things are still moving. I think we got a few closings next week and I'm grateful. Uh, but that's why we had that two prong approach. And I'm grateful that, you know, we both made the transition into multifamily. Hey, man, thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate the value add. Um, this was a really great opportunity to speak to you again. Uh, JCAM and Alternative Investments. Make sure you guys go check them out. You want to plug the website? People come check it out. They want to do yeah, some deals with it's, you. It's uh, jcaminvestments.com. That's J-K-A-M investments.com. And I also have my own podcast, which I'd love to have you on in the future. Absolutely. Called, Let's, do it. Let's do it. Yeah, it's called Alternative Investor Mastermind. And, uh, you know, we'll, we, talk, uh, we talk everything from multifamily, syndications, oil and gas, a little bit of crypto, a little bit of uh, points and miles, which is another hobby of mine. So it's really just everything I'm interested in. And uh, yeah, I would lo would love to have you on as well. And uh, if you could build me a house within a block of the train station somewhere in, uh, in our area there, especially like build, uh, you could find a lot that we could build a two family. Yeah, where, yeah. Uh, I could have a crash pad in New Jersey when I come to visit friends and family. Uh, I'll, I'm I'm ready to go. Sign sign me up if you find the right deal. <laughs> I got you. I saw your message on Facebook. I yeah. saw it. You, I, I, I feel bad trying to charge you market price though. I won't be able to give you a discount. You know what I mean? <laughs> uh, I've seen you. You build you build good quality stuff. At some point, if you're going to live it yourself, it can, sometimes it's okay to pay. It's okay to pay a little closer to retail. Uh, <laughs> All right, another great episode. Thanks for coming on. I really appreciate it. All right, guys, passion for real estate investments. I'm your host, Fuquan Bilal. Another great show. You can check us out on YouTube. Be sure to like and subscribe. Uh, check us out on all the other social media channels and wherever you find a podcast. We back like we never left. I'm glad I'm, I'm, glad I'm back on the scene doing podcasts. It's great. I learn something every time. I'm looking forward to being in your podcast and get the information when we close out. All right, guys, see you later. Catch you at the next one.